Good afternoon, everyone. This is Naishad Gadani coming to you from Melbourne. And today is 162nd episode of Career Care Package. And on today's episode, we are talking about career growth, career success, and tips for professional growth and development. It's a very seasonal and uh, you know, very important topic as we are coming out slowly, gradually of COVID-19. And Australia is also trying to open up its you know, internal borders and we are starting to see some economic activity coming back to normality. A lot of us are thinking about what to do now. What, where can I, uh, you know, build my career? I'm working as, you know, sales rep, and I want to become a sales manager. How do I do that? So it's a very interesting world, also that we find ourselves in. But in order to answer some of those questions, that what really contributes to a career success? Is it, is it about right time that you are at the right place at the right time? Is it skills? Is it experience? Is it serendipity or is it because you know uh, your your dad knew the the CEO of the company, whatever it is, right? So we want to explore all of this, but and to help us answer some of these questions, we have invited Jenny Wes. And Jenny has worked in four countries and has successfully built her career and now lives in Sydney. And she's here to answer our question, but more importantly, also your questions around career growth and career acceleration. So if you are watching this right now, and if you think that this can benefit some of your friends and family, tag them in the LinkedIn Live because it will do a world of favor to them. Before we get to Jenny, let's welcome Caroline Brown, the co-host of the show. Thanks, Nesh. It's really great to be here. And I'm very excited to be talking to you, Jenny, because when I saw that you'd worked on four, uh, four in four different countries, I thought you must have experienced a lot and have a lot to share with um, everybody as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic, I'm sure. So I, I think a great place to start would be for you to give people an understanding of the work that you do, because I think you come from a fairly unique perspective in the way that you um, work with people. Yeah. Um, currently, what I do is I provide leadership coaching. And as a subset of that is really I focus on, on areas of trauma and healing, trauma healing and recovery. What I've mm. seen in my profession, previously I did a lot of career coaching and that I kept getting clients who wanted to get into leadership or want to advance their careers. But what they were struggling with was trauma, either from early mm. childhood or in their adult life. And sometimes even trauma from work. And that mm. was what was holding them back. It wasn't that they didn't know how to go after the job or how to go after the opportunity or how even to write the best CV. It was the lack of belief in themselves because of what mm. the trauma had done. And so mm. I figured this is an area that I want to specialize in and, and let's see how we can crack this. Yeah. Mm. It's amazing kind of work because you don't often see a lot of people that do leadership coaching and that kind of trauma work. Often it's around you know, self-development skills and communication skills, but they don't tackle the underlying um, issues a lot of the time. So you, you you see that as really getting in the way or really stopping people from going as as uh, far as they'd like. Oh, absolutely. You know, it, and it also came from my personal experience. Yeah. I've had a, an, an amazing life, an amazing career that's taken me to many countries and multiple opportunities. Mm -hmm. Personally, I've seen how beliefs that I had have held me back. And I was not conscious to these beliefs. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what was going on, why I felt a certain way or why I was thinking about certain opportunities in a particular way. Why did I think that I wasn't good enough? Mm -hmm. Why did I hold myself back? And especially when I started seeing these patterns in my life develop over and over again, like, hmm, what's going on? I want to crack mm -hmm. this. Um, <laughs> Uh, I call it like going on an inner quest is really was yeah. trying to figure out what was the underlying reason. And at times it was programming. It was what mm -hmm. I was told about how the world should be. Mm -hmm. in, in, we hear this often. Uh, you know, some of us who grew up in, in more than 20 years ago, it, it was like our parents telling us, oh, you, you have to do what the bosses say. That was the world order, right? You are loyal to the company. You never spoke up speak only when spoken to 
And those were the old world beliefs, which in today's context does not apply. And some of us are still carrying those practices because we have those beliefs. And that's, those are the little things that hold us back from our careers. And I wanted to help people to unpack. So it's not necessarily entrenched in trauma, but it could, it is largely entrenched in what we, what we were told was the truth about the world. So interesting. I, I know I'm de we, we've got some questions that we do want to go through, but I just yeah. want to reflect on this because I think it's really important. A lot of the people, a lot of my friends that have had, had executive coaching, the first chunk of it is just letting go. That's almost like sometimes it's the first time that they've been heard yeah. um, in an organisational context around, um, you know, things that have come up from them and things that come up at work are similar to things that have come up outside of work or you know from their childhood and in other relationships as well so yeah um just wanted to ask you like the question one of the questions that we we, we spoke about was what you learned from working in four different different countries in terms of you know what it takes to succeed in your career can you give us some insights oh. around that how much time do we have <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> Um, I will tell you, so I'm originally from Singapore, that might provide a bit of context, and I, mm. I was raised in a very Indian background, that's the upbringing that I had. So coming, growing up in Singapore, you're exposed to multiple communities, language, food, it's, it's a myriad of the experiences that you would get, you would have, and Singapore has its own system of way of doing things, and for us, it was about trusting the system that was the mm -hmm. you trust the process because the process works and so when you come from that mindset where the process is reliable and sustainable when you go to other countries sometimes we we may or not expect that that should be the same mm -hmm. we think that that's how the world is organized and i remember going into the us and learning the power of free speech and mm -hmm. what it really meant being able to speak up and that was my first experience of I, outside when i was in singapore i didn't realize why it mattered but it was only mm. when i went to work in the us like oh i get it now i get why this matters so much of course it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that everyone uses that power as uh, purposefully as possible mm. so there are these imbalances that will appear however i understood why it was important to speak up why it was, it was important to express yourself and and learning about that cultural diversity that we have within the US in itself. And now with the elections going on, you know, it's so opportune that we're on this topic. Mm -hmm. And that was the beauty about America. And so learning how that mattered and the way of doing business in America is so different. It's, do you have the skills? Do you have the passion? Go for it. Mm. And that offered a different edge. So when you think about the entrepreneurial spirit, I see why that thrives really well in America because they have mm. that control, the cultural context and the country-based culture to support that entrepreneurial spirit. And in America, it's really about giving it a go. Uh, if the, if you want it, go for it. That's the real drive. That's my mm. that's been my experience of working with in America. And I came back back out to Asia a few years later, and I was in India and I was in China and in and, and Malaysia for a while. And each of these countries, they have their own beautiful culture as well and the way of doing business. It was in India that I learned the power of relationships. It's not about the system. It's really the power of relationships. Coming from Singapore, where it was about the system, that was an interesting adaptation for me. Mm -hmm. a period of uh, adoption for me it was understanding that it is okay to ask for help and you really need to because someone else has the answer to the solution looking for so mm -hmm. why try to do it yourself mm -hmm. and that was the beauty about being in india and beautiful experience so having that flexibility if you're if you're the type of person, if you're watching the show, if you're the type of person, you love culture, you love meeting people, you want to understand how people think and they operate. When you work in all these beautiful countries, that's the exposure that you get. And mm -hmm. I could not have guessed that that was how my career was going to go. <laughs> not, not even expected it. Mm -hmm. And it was beautiful. And coming to, to Australia, it, I love the culture. I, I tell some of my friends, I said, we have the OI culture here. Like, hey, don't do that because that's not great. Mm. And the the culture of giving it a go, 
mm. rock forth if that's what you want. So mm. in between, in I, I could it's as you start working with different people, you get to understand why they operate in a certain way. And I think that adds a beautiful dimension in any organization or any relationship. Yeah. Mm. I love the way you describe all of those because you can just picture those dynamics as you as you speak. So yeah. Yeah, Nesh, you look like you're bursting with the questions. <laughs> yeah, you know, I you know I, I can relate to that. I I think uh, you know if, if I take a very over overview of how uh, you know societies function, and you know that also translates into the world of work and you know how people perceive work and a um, lot of lot of the things in in yeah. India happens because you know someone. And you know, knowing someone is is kind of the leverage there. Um, you know, it's not just about getting a job, but just just how do you go about and you know get get your stuff you know every day in day out. So I think I think I can I can relate to. I don't even remember whether I used the internet to source information in India because I would know somebody who would uh, be able to help me out with that. But tell us about uh, you know also the impact of COVID. If I can you know go through the current topic. The impact of COVID-19, what are your observations around the impact of COVID on professionals uh, and their ability to, to think a little bit bigger? Because obviously, this has been time of a lot of inward journey for many, many of us. And we have taken a, a really deep dive into what it means for us, what work means for me, uh, you know, what do I want to do and everything else. But t tell us about your observations. Are, are people are you know, mm. are, are we still open to those ideas that I, I can still fly and I can still, you know, take a risk and I, I really want to do something bigger rather than being, uh, you know, you know, sticking to what I know. What are your, some of your observations around that? I think we've, we've kind of gone through a, a cycle of COVID and, you know, it, it when we started up with COVID, there was a lot of uncertainty and we were preparing for the worst. So the newspapers, the government, the, the statistics, it was a case of prepare for the worst. And when slowly we started seeing the slowdown in recruitment, we started seeing companies cut budgets, um, laying off the workforce, you know, these standard indicators of when there's an economic slowdown. It's not the first time we face something like that. It's just the first time, I think, more significantly globally that there, it was because of a pandemic. And so that caused that period of uncertainty and especially when we don't know how long the cycle is going to last. So what I saw in the early stages were people trying to grapple with uncertainty. What does it mean for them? What are the resources available to them? And what can they do about the current situation? Some were stranded. And that is that makes any person feel unsafe, you know, especially when you have to care for yourself and and what more when you have a family or a, a loved one to care for as well who's with you. So that that puts a lot of stress on someone. And being able to ride through that, being able to figure out a way of being resourceful, finding out solutions and asking for help. Those are the, some of the things that people had to do in order to get through that initial first period of uncertainty. The, the second piece that I saw was people who were like, oh, you know what? Great, maybe this is the time for me to go and study something, go learn something. Heaps of courses online, some were offering it for free. I, I think I saw Coursera saw a surge of something like 50%, if I'm not wrong. I remember seeing something like this. So there was a surge of people wanting to get education you know what courses can i learn and that was the type of questions that i was getting from folks who were out there looking for work and those who are already employed still employed at that time so what can i do to expand my knowledge base maybe this is the time where i start chasing my dream so some were even looking at hmm, is there potentially for me a chance to open start my own business what would that look like and with the digital age, with most of us going online for almost everything, it meant that there was this prolific increase in adoption in the way we were doing business, the way we were running our lives. I mean, how many of us have stepped into, you know, Kmart 
in the last 12 months, right? Or even the last six months, what are the chances of that? So changing the way we have operated has also impacted the way we think about work. What I've learned is as well, some of us have started to question, is this the job for me? Hmm. Is this what I really want to do? Is this the company I want to work for? Of the many people I've spoken to in the last three months, I've seen that more have left their jobs. Partly because it's time for a break. It's time for me to focus on something that's new, which is great. It means that organizations can then go and pick those who need the job, who've got, who've got the reasons or who've, who, need, who need that assistance. And so it's been an interesting mix of people making what I would say, making the most important decisions about their lives, about mm. their careers. And what does it mean for them, for their business, for their family, to be able to take it to the next level? Mm. Some uh, have been holding on, like, you know, what I have is safe. I'm just going to keep my toe out to see what comes up in the market. Market's been very quiet in some instances. Hopefully, we see a pickup. And so it's been that wait and see. In some organizations, they've seen booms. It's been great for them in your um, commerce retailers, e-commerce platforms, shopping, right? Um, they are seeing a big boom. Amazon <laughs> has seen a big yeah. boom. So what does it mean for them? And, and then the impact on their business. And I think that's where there's these new and interesting opportunities. And the, the way we used to do business has changed, has shifted. More companies are saying, we probably might stick to this remote model because it's really working for us. But at the same time, I think under, underlying all of, all of that is the employee health. Mm. What does it mean when you're in front of your desk 12 hours and mm. it takes two minutes to shift into the family? Mm. Whereas before, it would be an hour-long commute, a 45-minute commute. So when do you really clock off from work? I've done the whole work from home thing for quite a few years now. And I know you never really clock off, <laughs> right? You're, you're mm. constantly in the grind. So balancing that, I think that's the key. So some of us have moved very quickly into the digital workspace and some are still struggling. And these are, these are the areas that we need to focus on. Yeah. Mm. I hope I've answered that question. Oh, absolutely. I was just curious about with all of these people and, you know, Nation and I are kind of included in that, have made decisions around the work that we want to focus on. How do you know whether you're making a good decision? Like what, what's what's a good way to, if there is a thing to make a decision around that? Ooh, great question, Caroline. For one, I would say it would be a good balance of facts and emotions. Mm -hmm. That's what thing we need to do. If we have an emotional decision, our emotions sometimes they change. So mm. we need to have that rational basis to our decision making. So having the facts, and I'm not saying being absolutely certain, you're not going to have a hundred percent perfect plan. Mm. So there is Damn. going to be that. <laughs> we all want the ducks to line up, but none of them know how a straight line works. Yeah. <laughs> it's so it's really about having that balance. And mm. I, I call it the the two percent principle. The way the world is organized for us is we know about two percent of how this world is. The, mm -hmm. You know, science understands about two percent of our minds. Some of us know a bit more than that, but average Joe, two percent. Mm. We understand 2% about how the universe works and how the ocean works, how the environment works. It's a 2% principle, but somehow we believe it all works, right? We trust that it works. We'll figure it out as we go. Mm. And so the same thing comes with our plans. If we are the type to who needs 100% certainty, that's going to take a bit more time before we can execute on that decision. And mm. some of us are like, you know, I've got about 40% certainty on th that this could work. It's based on facts as well and got a good feeling about this. I've checked in with myself. I know I'm safe making this decision. Mm. I think those, for me, those would be the indicators. Is mm. that, does that resonate with how you make decisions? 
Yeah, I think so. Um, sometimes you've just got to, and maybe it's that Aussie, you know, just have a go and see what happens. Yeah. But sometimes you, you realise that you don't know, but there are some nice unintended consequences from that. Precisely. That never, yeah, never experienced. So. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, take I think the horse's blinders to, off. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think we like to think that we're very rational and based on fact, but I think a lot of it's, most of it's emotion anyway. So, yeah. Well, that's yeah. I, yeah. I walk into an electronic store and I'll buy the stuff that's in red. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. about as rational as yeah. yeah, so <laughs> that Because red goes yeah, fast. And that's why... I think that that's why Apple sells for seventeen hundred dollars, and Samsung sells for probably nine hundred dollars, just because of how people relate to those things. If you can now, you know, track back to the career growth aspect, uh, you know, for uh, for the next question around what what do you constitute contribute your success to? Where do you think that that your success came through, and what are some of your learnings uh, from that? So. You know, I I think that um, you know, lo you know, it's you know, it's difficult sometimes to really pinpoint something. But if you want to give us yeah, some clue sure, into what contributed and and what do you want to tell people who are right now in that phase of how to grow, yeah. what are some of your you know thinking on that? One thing for me was I never settled on the status quo. I was never okay with you know things work great. I was always looking for what else can we do? What can we do a little bit better to improve the customer experience, to improve employee relationships, to improve our bottom line, our top line? What else can we do better? And so for me, that was kind of like my curiosity. It was my personal drive. And, and I love that because it took me to places, it took me to relationships that I would never have uncovered if I hadn't had that drive within me. I would not, um, yeah, I was constantly looking, searching, reading, studying, doing everything I can, speaking to someone, even when it terrified me at moments, like, sounds like a stupid question, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and, and really having that, that purpose, that helped fuel me in my career as well. The, the second thing is have lunch with someone if you can. And these days I get it, so have virtual coffees. It's the human connections that make a difference. It's the humans that will make a decision about the business. And that's what matters. I found that when I met up with people for, for coffee or for drinks or did social events, it allowed me to understand more about them, what drove them, what challenged them, what is it that they were focused on, as opposed to something that I, you know, if I had waited for an email to show up, that allowed me to plan ahead, think ahead. So I would ruminate on the what else I could do. And that gave me that added layer. And I love the relationships. I It wasn't easy for me coming from Singapore where it was all about, you know, systems. You'll trust the systems. <laughs> and going into America where it, you start learning about speaking up, asking, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit. And that really opened up things for me. And I realized that, Actually, people want to, want to have lunch with you. They want to go out with someone who's not from their own department. They want to meet someone from the other side of the aisle to get a different perspective. And it's not about whether you agree or disagree. It's now you have an additional perspective, an added lens to see the world from their view. And that is what I feel makes helps businesses to make better decisions. If those are, yeah, those are the two things that I would say to anyone, no matter what we're going through, whether it's COVID or after COVID, that's what I would highly recommend. Yeah, that, that, that sounds great. I think, uh, you know, looking, looking at the, what is possible, I think we spoke about that, Caroline and Jenny, in our, uh, I think two weeks back, we had Vikram who talked mm. about the growth mindset. Yeah. And which is, I think, which is in, uh, in alignment to what you're saying is, thinking about what's possible i think finding finding where i can contribute and add add value you know through those uh, through those my actions i think that also contributes exactly. to to those successes did uh, because we also spoke to more you know Maury morgan who runs a 
uh, you know, business in China, and he talked about serendipity, and you know, it's a fair, it was a fascinating discussion that we had. Do you think serendipity played, uh, you know, a role, or, or not played a role in your, just your career, but does it play a role uh, that you've seen serendipity playing a role in people's success? Um. I, I like this phrase of, you know, say yes and figure out how. And I think when you say yes to opportunities, that's when things or people start showing up in your life. So whether it's it's what you've created or what you've manifested, you know, we, we could judge it either way. What I What I do see is as long as you're taking a step forward, no matter how clumsy, clunky, or awkward it feels, as long as you're taking that one step, I call it the 1%, do that 1% and let everything else fall into place because you've shifted and therefore things shift. It's when you're trying to glide through water, as long as your fingers are pointed forward, the water will have to part for you. That's how I see it. That's how I visualize it. So keep taking that 1%. And um, yeah, and things show up. It's amazing when you ask for help, when you're speaking to others. Yeah, that's, that's, that's my belief. It's a lovely way to put it. What about in terms of, you know, I imagine that you coach a lot of people around making change. So if somebody's struggle, struggling to make a change, what, what are your strategies or your, your, what's your guidance on, on making that, that happen for them? Great question. I I look at it from a few ways. One of the most common mm. common cases that I hear of is procrastination. Procrastination mm. and <laughs> and in in my world, in my practice, procrastination typically comes from a place of, you know, when we chunk it all the way down to the core of it, mm. it typically comes from a place of I'm not good enough. Mm. And it's it can be triggering or it can be something that was a belief that was given to you, you were told. And it's, it's sometimes these things, they don't seem to make rational sense. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of our minds. We don't know what it holds. So it's when we figure out what is it that it's stopping us from doing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need effective strategies to get overcome. I know I procrastinate, so I need, effective strategies. Admin, big ball, can't cope. <laughs> so Friday, I park myself in front of my laptop and sort out my admin. That's my strategy for dealing with, you know, not procrastinating through admin. So I get it mm. done. But there are other areas in my life where I know I'm procrastinating, not because of a lack of a strategy, but because of something else. Mm. A belief that I had that, that made me feel like I'm not good enough, that maybe this is not the place, this is not the time, this is not my time. Mm -hmm. And I have to unpack that. So if you find that the strategy isn't working for you, we are always on the lookout for on the internet, Dr. Google, tell me how to do this. And mm -hmm. if that solution isn't resonating, then I feel that there's something else. And maybe it's mm -hmm. worth exploring either with a coach. Mm -hmm. And trust me, sometimes we know what's been holding mm -hmm. us back. We've mm -hmm. not, we've not had the chance to make that connection. So. And firstly, on top of all, all of what I've shared, you know, is it okay that we feel this way? Mm. Is it okay? And why, you know, do we need to shame or judge ourselves for being mm. this way? Mm. The goal is not to be a perfect human. The goal is mm. to be a functioning human. So mm. what would that look like? So having mm. that balance and having a bit of play and fun doing it, mm. the clunky, the awkward, the clumsy. Mm. <laughs> It's all right to be totally imperfect by the sounds of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it is really interesting, that procrastination, because I know, you know, just with some some things, my thing is, oh, I think I'm not going to enjoy it. Like, if I peel it back, I'm like, that's not going to be fun. Mm. And I'm like, how do I know, you know? Yeah, so that, you that's been my challenging bit of, why don't you just try, you know, you might enjoy it. So Give it um, a go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's like eating broccoli for the first time. Right? <laughs> uh, you know. So, what you doing, kids, Nash? <laughs> yeah, after after that, uh, what do we have? Uh, Ice cream, broccoli. Mm. Uh, 
I said, but that's a cousin brother of yeah. cauliflower. Yeah, he lost me at Just cauliflower. A bit <laughs> you could have said ice cream, Nish. Like, lost me at cauliflower. Uh, I don't know. I'm just. I'm just a pragmatic dad, Brothers you know, Brothers. I just want to, I don't want to sugarcoat much around and say this is what we have or otherwise have lemonade and go to sleep. Uh, it's a non-negotiable, yes. Mm. yes. But that, that's why I said, now tell us about the, you know, the building relationship part in the, in the, in the new world, which is, which, you know, I, I say it's a very noisy world. It's a very... You know, for you to really, really, a lot of, lot of us talk about, and you know, I'm included in that, you know, furthering that thing around stand out and differentiate yourself, and mm -hmm. and all those, those things that I've been talking about. It's, it's, it's a great saying. You know, it's like, you know, it, it just makes other people go wow, but it really hardly make any difference because, you know, it's a, it's a very noisy world. You know, specifically, you know, the the social media world is very noisy so tell us about two things what is about the the building relationship part uh, and tell us about the you know your experience of using linkedin and how it has really helped you to build relationship and also starting to find the right audience for yourself and starting to get the tribe around what you are doing you know the work that you are doing around leadership and everything how that has evolved for you jenny Wow. Okay. Um, so in today's world, building the relationship, we have this added challenge of not having a face-to-face -face meeting. And where most of us spend this time being digital, it's even harder to get that digital time even because people are exhausted, you know, suffering from Zoom fatigue or Netflix fatigue, things like that. Although I would say Netflix fatigue is debatable. <laughs> definitely the zoom fatigue and wanting needing to be on calls or video calls for that moment for for that yeah so in this sense how do you get in front of someone how do you build that connection and what more when it's someone you don't know with any relationship whether it's brand new or it's an existing relationship what people want to know is do you care about me and secondly is what do you want to care about how are you going to help me? And if we can answer those questions, so some of it requires doing due diligence. Some of it is, um, you know, in meet, speaking with others who are connected to this one person that you're trying to get in touch with. And then starting to build that bridge. It might take five times, five tries before you get that meeting. And with some, it will take eight. Persistence is key. Whether it's online or offline, persistence is key. Ask any successful salesperson, any successful customer or client relationship manager, they will say, that's what's going to take, that's what's going to make it happen, persistence. But really making sure that in your message you communicate, I, I want to connect with you because I care about you and I understand that you have this one thing and I feel that I would be the person to help you with it. I want to have a quick chat. Three minutes or five minutes, I would never put it past 15 minutes because today 15 minutes feels like anything longer than 15 minutes feels like an imposition. You need permission. I find that typically most people are liberal, especially when you speak to leaders of companies, they're quite liberal with their time. In that sense, if it's a really great conversation, they will give you 30 minutes. And, they, and they're getting heaps of value from speaking with you. So building that inroad into the organization, into that person that you want to connect with and not going, I want a job. And I, I'm sure like me, you probably get a lot of emails. Can you get me a job? And really what we, when you're speaking to someone who is in a leadership position or in a managerial position at, in a company, they want to know how can you solve my problem? What skill sets do you have that will solve my problem? So get curious about that business, you know, thinking with that hat of what can I do better? You may not have the perfect answer. Again, the goal is in perfection, but really it's about your curiosity because between you and the next person, they are probably doing the, can you give me a job? Whereas you're going, I know how I can help your business. And that's what's going to make you stand out. 
And as you get better and better, don't focus on 20,000 companies. Pick the one. Pick the one that you want to work with. Mm. Pick the one person that, mm. you know, based on their LinkedIn profile, looks like a safe target. <laughs> you can see but by the way they engage. Are they engaging on other people's posts? Are they sharing information? What are they sharing on LinkedIn? And, mm. and how have they grown in their career? And mm. that's where you, what the, those are the things that you want to pay attention to. And based mm. off that, build that relationship. It might take eight times before you start warming up the seat. So mm. yeah, give, give it a go, especially now, even more so. I heard a wonderful saying about networking in particular, it was like the extra mile is, always, is never crowded in that scenario. So I so think true. a lot of people, myself included, would tend to give up after the, the third time, then, you know, um, it's harder then to find a reason to, to connect. But I, yeah. I like what you're saying about, about keeping on trying because you never know, you know, yeah. and people are very, very busy and keeping it quite simple as well, you know, not 15 minutes but five minutes. Yeah. Um, you know, a quick chat versus a meeting, you know, the languaging around that as well. So Precisely. Yeah. And, you know, check out their posts. They are posting somewhere most of mm. the time. If it's not on LinkedIn, it's probably another platform. Sorry, LinkedIn. It's, <laughs> they are posting somewhere. So if you're really curious about them and really curious about their business and totally obsessed, totally obsessed in wanting to work in their team, mm. do that. Go that extra mile. Take a few more. Take the leap. Mm. Nothing to lose. You're not losing anything by telling them, hey, I'm kind of stalking you, but in a safe way. <laughs> In a totally respectful and non-creepy oh, way. Yeah. Not <laughs> creepy. Yeah. <laughs> Don't call the digital police. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I agree. I, I was recently uh, you know contacted by somebody who has an interest in uh, developing as a careers coach, careers counseling. She doesn't work in our she actually comes from an IT background, but she has naturally developed uh, the you know, the ability to coach and mentor, uh, you know, her friends and family members. And she just got intrigued by that. And I really like the way she approached me, you know, that this is what my interest started. And I wanted to, you know, have a quick chat yeah. with you, provided if you're happy with it, to share some of how did you become a careers counselor? And, you know, what uh, what did you do to, to study? What kind of, you know, things that you can recommend me and everything else? And we started to have a chat which lasted for an hour uh, because for, there was there was a time where i felt uh, you know a little bit my ego got inflated a little bit that someone's coming to ask me for help but then eventually it also now turning into an informal mentor mentee relationship and that is what i think that is where the the real value is i think many yeah. people rightly pointed out many people are happy to to share those things, provided uh, the approach is thoughtful, is relevant, and you come across as somebody who is genuinely looking for some help rather than, you know, sucking their, uh, you know, relationship and, you know, taking the advantage of it. Because that's what you know, many people are worried about, that you are going to take away the network as if there's a tangible thing. But you know, they, have, they feel worried about that, um, I'm not going to introduce you to anyone because I don't know who you are, right? Yeah. So I think that that's pretty important, Jenny. Yeah, you know, how many of us actually go around on LinkedIn liking people's posts, commenting, I really love your stuff. I enjoy what you're sharing. This really resonates with me. So the most of us are out here posting something on the platform, get engaged. This is mm -hmm. the community. These are the people you want to work with. These are the people you want to connect with. It's not about, can they get something for me? Mm. It's how can I show up and support mm. them? And mm. trust me, the number of times I've done that and it turned into, hey, Jenny, I noticed that you are constantly on my post. I wasn't looking for anything. They went, can we help you? Can I help you with mm. something? I'm like, mm. wow, thank you. I hadn't mm. thought of it. Give me a minute. Mm. <laughs> But really, it was that that sincerity of saying, "I love what you're doing." Mm. It does come from that, doesn't it? Like it's like, and people, I mean, the thing about getting that random email is you to say yes, you have to believe that they're 
picked you. Like there is something that you can offer from your background and your expertise. So Nash, I'm sure if they said, can you help me get a job as a project engineer and you don't have that in your background or, you know, give me yeah. some advice about that, you, you don't, you know, it's like, well, no, I'm not in the position to. So, um, yeah. Exactly. Precisely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And Excellent. there are so many people in the network. You, you, the key is asking, asking for mm -hmm. help. And if we have someone and we feel that you're genuine, we would definitely pass it on get someone to help mm. you out that's that's mm. what a network is for i mm. think it's important that we we understand as individuals we need to make that effort to build the relationship in the first place mm. and not make it all about us mm. make it really all about the other person all mm. about them.com make that your focus <laughs> excellent jenny look you know fascinating to pick your you know your ideas and insight and uh, you know it's just those are simple and just uh, you know effective strategies for all of us to to look forward to implementing uh, you know in our career. Thanks again for mm -hmm. joining us uh, for this uh, you know episode of LinkedIn Live. Thank you again. You're most welcome, and thank you for having me on the show. It's been absolutely fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, so. everybody. Have a great day. Bye bye now. Thank you. Now uh, tomorrow. Uh, is we are telling you a story, everyone, but uh, not me. I'm I'm not a great storyteller. We are asking Sandy McDonald. She's going to come and talk about storytelling and the importance of that storytelling in the ever-changing world of work and how can you really tell an effective and engaging and interesting story about your career to your stakeholders so that they said, I want to hire nation. And that's what we are going to talk about Tomorrow. So do join us tomorrow, 3 p.m. Melbourne time, and we are talking about storytelling in your career. Until that, please look after yourself and your loved ones and stay happy and stay healthy. And I know we are all watching with uh, hold breath about what's happening in U.S. elections. So please, whatever that happens, LinkedIn Live will still go on. <laughs> career will still go on. Well, we'll be here to talk <laughs> whichever way that you that you experience. Don't worry. We'll see you tomorrow. Until then, bye for now, everyone. Bye.